On today's episode of the Milk Making Minutes, we hear how you can spend more time bonding with your baby while on parental leave and after, and the impacts that breastfeeding had on Millie's extensive travels, and what she learned about the culture of breastfeeding while traveling. As you listen, think about the cultural norms of baby feeding where you live. Do you see babies and toddlers of all ages snuggled up against their caregivers getting nutrition and comfort openly? Why or why not? What impacts would that have on families if it were the case? And secondly, what impacts would adventuring more have on your family? Get ready for a dose of inspiration from my guest, Millie. When I began breastfeeding, I was blindsided by how difficult it was. I may have thought I was prepared, but having known only a handful of people who had ever breastfed and only seeing it up close from a couple of them, I had a huge learning curve. Since then, I've become a doula, a lactation consultant, and a childbirth educator. I'm your host, Lo Nigrosh, and I welcome you to the Milk Making Minutes, where we explore breastfeeding experiences through the lens of systemic barriers so that you know your breastfeeding struggles are not your fault and your triumphs really are the miracles you feel they are. So I'm Millie. I'm a midwife in London. My partner's Stu and we've got a baby girl now. She's just turned one. So yeah. And I met you um, virtually on Instagram because you have such a beautiful Instagram account filled with lovely (laughs) breastfeeding photos. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing over there. I'm usually a midwife and I have no idea how to use social media or anything like that. Um, but I'd always, we'd always plan to travel on maternity leave. It was always something I thought, why, do, why doesn't everyone do this? Um, I know it's a bit different in America, but in England, we get paid a certain amount of time during maternity leave. So I felt that it was better traveling when I was getting my work pay than sitting at home. So um, we went off traveling for about, and we're still traveling now. Um, and it's been amazing. And, um, when we were out there, I thought, wow, this is so great. I'd love, I, why, do, why doesn't, it, why don't all parents do this? Before diving into Millie's experience of traveling the world while breastfeeding, I asked her to take us back to when she was a midwife about to have her first baby and what that felt like to be experiencing what she had supported so many others through herself. This is what she had to say. It was very awakening, actually, um, suddenly being the woman having a baby and having all the health professionals around me. Um, you realize how vulnerable you are and how much you yeah. learn from, you know, the doctors and the midwives. And yeah, even though that I had the knowledge, I felt quite, yeah, at the mercy of everyone. So it's going to definitely help me um, as a midwife in the future, how I am. Um, with yeah, exactly. Yeah. So before we get into your own story, I know you were a midwife, so you probably had quite a lot of exposure, but what was your personal exposure to breastfeeding before you were pregnant and making a decision about feeding your baby? I mean, I guess probably um, being a midwife was a big part of it, but I've always been loved breastfeeding. I think it's so like fascinating that women are able to nurture their babies off their own milk. And it's something that I've always loved um, as part of my work and just finding out about it from other women that have had babies. Um, I've always, I've always been really passionate about breastfeeding my own baby. Um, And I guess because I had the knowledge, it, it did help me quite easily initiate breastfeeding after I had my baby. Um, I expressed while I was pre- towards the end of pre- my pregnancy, I expressed milk. So it sort of helped my milk come when I had my baby. And I guess I was quite, you know, I had that bit more knowledge about positioning and I had friends to help me with breastfeeding. Um, um, so breastfeeding as support is so paramount in sort of helping women breastfeed in those early days. And I definitely got that because of my colleagues and friends. But I think yes. that really helped me, you know, sustain breastfeeding. Mm. Sadly, it's yeah, so- not the same for everyone. Um, Ex- yes, it's not. Yeah. So I would like to take you back then before your midwifery days, were you exposed to breastfeeding then? Um, I wasn't, <laughs> not really. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, um, I, I'd seen breastfeeding before. I mean, I guess I knew my mum had breastfed, 
but but not really. It was only really um, made away to me as a student midwife. Mm. Helping, it was one of the first things we did as a midwifery student, helping mums, you know, support them with breastfeeding. And I think that's when I grew a real interest in it. Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. So, um, when it was your time when you were pregnant and thinking about breastfeeding, what were the goals that you had set for yourself? So I was passionate about breastfeeding my baby, um, the ease of it, the nutrition for my baby, but also an extra part of it was because of this travel we wanted to go on with our baby, which I felt mm-hmm. like breastfeeding would make it so freeing and easy. Um, obviously when you travel you can be um, more likely to get certain I don't know tropical illnesses and breastfeeding helps reduce infection there's so many reasons why I really wanted to breastfeed while we were traveling and make sure it was really easy and yeah sustained during the first year of my baby's life so that was an extra part of it um and actually it's it's been such a fundamental part for me Make, uh, w- traveling with our baby breastfeeding her whether it's like a really long coach journey or um you know a, a new accommodation it always relaxes our baby and it's sort of just as much for the bonding as anything else and the sort of yeah the, the ease of looking after our baby <laughs> yeah yeah and did you have um do you have goals in mind for how long you would like to continue I'm not sure. I've always loved the idea of breastfeeding up to the age of two. Obviously, going back to work, I'm not really sure what will happen. But I like the idea of my baby self-weaning, sort of deciding when she is less interested. To be honest, she's Mm -hmm. a very, she likes breastfeeding a lot. So I'm not sure if that Mm -hmm. will ever happen. Do you do 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 on-call work? Sorry? Do you do on-call work? I'm not at the moment. Um, yeah, that would obviously be difficult and shift work is more difficult, but I, I, I guess she breastfeeds less in the day now. She's realized, Mm -hmm. you know, how amazing, I don't know, strawberries are and all these other foods. So she's, she's content with other things other than me, but it's Mm -hmm. always part of our bedtime routine. And anytime she's upset, it's like a really nice way to calm her down and make her happy. Yeah. (laughs) I'm not sure what I do about it, to be honest. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, I definitely want to hear all about, um, traveling and breastfeeding because that's really what drew me to asking you to be on the show. Um, but in order for that to have been possible, you had to get breastfeeding off to a good start. Yeah. And yeah, sorry. (laughs) Yeah. So I wanted to know if there was anything about your birth that impacted breastfeeding, whether positively or, or um, negatively in looking back. Yeah. So I had an elective C-section and I, it didn't actually negatively affect my breastfeeding, but I was, I was worried that it would, um, our baby was breached. So we sort of knew for a few months that we were going to have a C-section and it can be a little, I've, I've seen it, um, women struggle sometimes more after a C-section because you've got all these wires on your hands and, um, sometimes breastfeeding isn't initiated as much, but I found it was quite straightforward, um, with our baby she latched on really quickly as soon as we came out of the theater and she sort of was a fantastic breastfeeder. So um, it didn't really impede us actually. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. So interesting to be the midwife who has a C-section. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you have to process those feelings at all as you were making that decision? Absolutely. I always had dreams of most natural home birth um my partner delivering a baby so keeping our placenta um I never I mean c-sections are common in the UK but I never thought that that would be like our birth journey and I'm really upset about it but actually it was really nice our c-section I recovered pretty quickly um after a week or so mm. I my say myself and it was it was just actually a really lovely experience so Oh, so, I guess so great. Yeah. Either side, you know, you can still have a lovely birth experience. However you give. Yeah. 
I was just talking um, on, on Instagram with this uh, doctor uh, that I follow, an OBGYN who really works to help people feel empowered in their birth experiences. And we were just chatting about how it really, in the end, what matters is that someone felt like they had the control and the yeah. power. Yeah. Um, 100%. It, the, the, we cannot control the outcome when it comes to birth or breastfeeding we really can't we can and and I think being as a, a patient I realize like even more just the communication and you know people letting you know what's happening and people being nice to you is all that really good and I'm so glad that it didn't um impact breastfeeding so you were able to take her right away she got lapsed right away yeah and did yeah. you have any difficulty in the beginning any pain or anything you had to work through in those first weeks postpartum um I, I mean I came with my nipple cream because I knew that that's you know you can get sore nipples um initially and I did get a slight sore nipple in the first few days but I, it was really straightforward actually I think I'm not sure if because our baby was like born tiny. So maybe she just knew she had to breastfeed really well to get bigger. Um, but it was quite an easy journey in terms of the breastfeeding, which I was so thankful about after yeah. finding out about the C-section. Yeah, it's great. It's hard when somebody gets a double whammy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess we'll get onto this, but probably the harder aspect was when um, our baby was three weeks old. My partner was diagnosed with a brain tumor so he was incredibly oh. sick um and actually the breastfeeding then became a little it was both fantastic but also it became difficult because my baby wasn't allowed in the hospital to visit him um mm. so you know a breastfeeding baby is incredibly tied to you so I couldn't leave her with anyone else to go and see him at the hospital so I would have to get a really close family or friend to sort of stand outside the hospital with her and then they'd call me an hour later when she was crying ready for a breastfeed and I'd run back out so oh, man. that is that was probably the difficult aspect of breastfeeding in the early weeks <laughs> wow. Millie's partner had been completely fit and healthy even spearfishing before the shocking diagnosis he went to the doctor after their baby Poppy was born due to ongoing headaches that they chalked up to sleep deprivation. He needed emergency brain surgery one week later, and it took several months to recuperate. Millie was able to move in with her mother, who cared for them and caringly emphasized to Millie that her job was to feed Poppy. Brain tumor or not, think about the people in your life who provided that level of support. We should all be that lucky to have someone who says your job is to feed your baby, do nothing else. In some places, that is the cultural norm after someone has a baby. And sadly, so many of us come home to so many responsibilities. Knowing that their plan had always been to travel during maternity leave, I wanted to know what impact Stu's brain surgery had on their plans. We always decided when she was two months, um, in some respects, you sort of get signed off from the midwives, your body starts to, you know, come back and you have your first set of vaccines in the UK. So we thought we'd head off after that. Um, we thought she'd be quite easy at that stage in some ways because she'd be really light and sleep a lot. Um, but obviously, when my partner was hospitalised, we our travel plans were thrown out the window. We thought we'd never travel I mean I thought he wouldn't come out of the hospital let alone we'd go traveling so mm. that was the last thing we talked about but um yeah after a couple of months when he came home we I guess we started getting bored of being at home and he was getting better and our travel plans resurfaced mm. it, as well as being like an amazing experience for us it's been like part of his recovery as well so after I'm a month, sure he felt, you know himself again which has been amazing Mm -hmm. now did he get a paid paternity leave as well so he, he did yep yeah. so he gets um some paternity leave that we share um and then i we, we kind of share with unpaid leave as well talk to us then about your your husband's recovering your recovering and you realize we really can travel with this baby what did that planning look like and how did you finally take the leap? Yeah, so I always thought it, 
it was going to be my recovery that I guess hindered us going. Um, ever since I, I found out about the C-section, I thought, oh no, my, I'm just not going to feel physically up for it for a good few months. I'm going to be sleep deprived. I'm going to feel horrible. And actually I did, I mean, you do feel crappy after you've had a baby, obviously. Um, you know, I, I was just like any other woman. I felt like I'd, I couldn't leave the house in the first few weeks. I, could, I didn't even know what time it was. I felt like complete sleep tortured. Um, and I, I thought, how on earth would I go traveling? Like, how is it, you know, how can you go traveling when you're so sleep deprived? But I find almost being a, being away and traveling um, is you, you feel better than sitting at home in my flat with my baby, sort of just being out in the fresh air and doing stuff. It does. It makes me feel better. So it's mm. not like, you know, I didn't feel rubbish at the beginning. Um, but then, yeah, I guess just as I started feeling like myself after a couple of weeks, my partner um, went to the hospital. So that just changed everything. It was a massive curveball. We, uh, I, yeah, the travel plans went out the window. And I think, so we did a, a couple of smaller trips when he was starting to feel better. Um, in like December, November, we went like for a week to two places in Europe. And it was so it was, it was so great being with our baby abroad. I felt like I enjoyed. I had a I was in a better mental space to enjoy being with my baby and bonding with her and playing with her. I mean, I guess everyone enjoys being on holiday, don't, don't they? And it was just the same with my baby, where I felt this kind of like release of stress that I'd felt being around my flat, looking after her. It was yeah, amazing traveling with her. And after that, those two trips, we thought let's you know, embark on this massive trip that we'd always wanted to do. Um, we, so the plan was to go from one end of the Americas, like the tip of South America and finish in Canada and travel all the way up. But in my head, I, I never actually committed to the trip. I thought, you know, there's too much pressure if we commit. How can we know even what's going to happen with our baby the next day, let alone four months from now. So we left it quite mm. open-ended. We didn't book flights till the very last minute. We were The plan was like super flexible and it just made me feel more relaxed that, you know, there didn't need to be any pressure on ourselves. Mm. Yeah. It, as soon as we, we kind of got into the swing of things, we were away for it. We, we went to Rio and then we headed to Patagonia, which is just like this heaven of mountains and nature and, yeah at that point I was like why why don't we just do this entire trip it's so much nicer than being at home and it's such an amazing mm. place to be with our baby yeah I'd love to hear um I would love to hear a little bit more about this comparison that you're talking about between being at home in your apartment or flat maybe or being out and about and traveling because I get a lot of questions about traveling while breastfeeding and it seems like big stressful thing to overcome but I know for me when I was able to travel with my babies or even now when I travel with my children the anticipation of leaving of getting everything together to go is difficult or stressful but then once I leave I actually find I'm able to tune into my children a little bit more and stress of home life allows me to actually feel better about my mothering. So ha talk to me a little bit more about how you um, were able to, you know, make that transition. I love the idea of the two small trips that you took. And then what did you feel like you needed to make sure that you were comfortable with your baby um, while you were traveling? And then taking the leap to this this longer trip that you were doing yeah I mean I completely relate to how you feel I think that just it's it's so difficult to comprehend how you could travel with your baby being doing something so adventurous getting on a flight with your baby being in your accommodation um and it's quite it's difficult to mentally prepare yourself it feels like such a big thing but actually when I'm at home in my flat, I find that I get very restless. I always want to be doing stuff, whether that's fixing things around the house or cooking or cleaning or I, I don't know. I get this restless anxiety where I can't fully focus on just chilling out with my baby, playing with her, 
really like mm. you know being in a good mental space to just enjoy my baby um so it was such a liberating feeling when we went on these two trips to actually just like really take it slow be mindful be in the moment with my baby and I, I enjoy, enjoyed bonding with her so much more abroad um obviously in terms of packing it was great I was breastfeeding so that uh, she was you know b- below six months so that's all she needed she didn't require any stuff apart from nappies and things that you know you think that will be stressful like a, an airplane with a baby they were just they were absolutely fine again breastfeeding was brilliant because it helps equalize their ears it helps them not be stressed in the airport um we i wear my baby like in a sling carrier so i can actually breastfeed in it mm. which is I, I was walking around the airport breastfeeding and no one even noticed it was really liberating so every time you know mm. she was stressed i had that amazing tool and after these two trips yeah i just I was still really nervous about a big travel, especially, you know, it was through South America, so far away and so exotic, but it gave us the confidence that we could just go for it. Um, And obviously it was a far longer flight. It was like a 10 hour flight through the night. But again, it was actually, it's, although it's difficult, it can be more difficult traveling with a baby than traveling without a baby. There's so many rewarding factors traveling with a baby. And I think it's just, you know, seeing everything through their eyes, having those special moments with your baby, just feeling really excited that you're able to live out your dreams with your baby as a mum. It all just felt, it feels really special. Um, mm. And breastfeeding has been a massive part of that. I think just like the lack of stuff that I have to bring, uh, whether it's, you know, like the, the tropical heat, you know that I can always hydrate my baby. Poppy, she's good um calming her down getting her to sleep I know that you're not supposed to feed to sleep but it's it's really nice being able to do that Um, I mean this they that says when they say you shouldn't feed to sleep I don't know who this they is because humans have been doing that for all of humankind yeah yeah um yeah yeah, yeah. One of the things that I love about traveling with my kids, even, you know, my kids are almost nine yeah. and almost five. And, you know, I get stressed about the expectations of the bedtime routine mm-hmm. to this day mm-hmm. here at the house. But when I'm traveling with my kids, we're all in one room. Yeah. They're less stressed out. I'm less stressed out. We're able to just fall into bed when we're all tired. <laughs> and it's not this stressful thing of, okay, it's time for your bedtime. So I have to get the people who don't want to sleep down into bed and, you know, try to make it as calm as possible and try to keep connected to them throughout this yeah. time because we're all together in a family room. And Ideally, that's probably what I would do. Uh, You know, my husband, he is not so keen on the idea of a family room. So, of course, in families, there are compromises and (laughs) you have to make it work for everyone in the family. Um, And that's, you know, that's fine. I'm fine with my kids at eight and five having their own bedrooms. (laughs) But, you know. When you travel, it's nice because yeah. it just takes the stress off of that kind of thing. It's a little more snuggly and cozy. Absolutely. All those expectations go out the window and you can just do what feels fun. And yeah, you can just enjoy bonding with your family however you want to. Because you're yeah, exactly. But right. Yeah, yeah. No, it's silly, I yeah. guess, because I completely feel like that. But actually on maternity leave, it's not that I, I wasn't working. I didn't need to have this really strict routine because I wasn't getting up, you know, for a shift. But it still felt like that. I think just being in my flat at home, feeling like I needed to always be doing something, whether yeah, whether it's cleaning or some boring task, um, it, it sort of ruined my, you know, appreciation for playing and bonding with my baby. And that I, that's just been so nice being abroad and having all those moments where I feel not stressed and she's not stressed and we can just like do nothing together. And you really need that time with your baby. Um, yes. chores, and they don't want to do anything apart from hang out with you. 
Yeah, exactly. And that can impact milk supply significantly. Often we see a dip in milk supply as people return to work or as other duties in their life start to increase, even if they're not returning to work. Absolutely. Yeah. And if, yeah. And if people had enough time to actually just be with their babies and focus on feeding mm -hmm. them, and also experiencing the joy of what's around them, which you can do more when you're not at home feeling burdened by the tasks of home. Yep. I think it would have an impact on increasing milk supply and maintaining a milk supply that is enough for your baby. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I've actually, I, I always enjoy breastfeeding, but I particularly enjoyed it while we've been traveling. I guess it's been another thing when I've been back at home in my flat where I'm always busy and then I've got to breastfeed for 15 minutes and it's, you know, I've been mm -hmm. doing something else and it's felt like sometimes occasionally a chore. <laughs> Whereas when I'm traveling, I mean, it's just really nice state of mind where I just, I guess I'm not doing anything else. So it's just such a nice thing to do. Whatever, whether we're, you know, yeah. sitting on a bus or um, sitting on a beach, I always enjoy breastfeeding while I'm away. Hi, listeners. I want to take a moment to make a quick request. In addition to continuing to hear ordinary people share their breastfeeding triumphs and struggles, I have big plans for the Milk Making Minutes, which includes asking incredible people we all admire to come on the show and share their stories of nursing their babies through amazing circumstances. I'm looking at you, Serena Williams, but there are others too. So in order for them to know this show is worth their time, I need my listeners to rate and review. So please take a minute to do that on your favorite listening app. That will bring more people to the show so that you can hear their amazing baby feeding stories of struggle and triumph. Thanks. Yeah. Have you encountered throughout your travels um, any um, negative attitudes towards public breastfeeding or has it been the opposite? So it's it. we started in Patagonia and ended in Canada. South and Central America seem to have the most fantastic breastfeeding culture. Every Particularly Guatemala the most where everyone just breastfeeds every age of child, like sometimes would be tandem feeding. I'd be speaking to a mom who would be breastfeeding her three-year-old and her one-year-old. And it was such a beautiful breastfeeding culture. Like, you know, I'd be breastfeeding and an old man would just come chatting to me and he wouldn't even bat an eyelid mm -hmm. at what I was doing. Mm -hmm. It just felt so freeing. And it pretty much through South and Central America, you know, obviously my baby was getting bigger. Um, so it was more obvious I was breastfeeding. But I felt so relaxed about it, absolutely uninhibited. Wherever I was, I could breastfeed and just, it was such the norm. Um, and people would just come up to you and they would love it. Like the locals would come and chat and be like, well done, like, I love that you're breastfeeding. Like it would just be such a bonding experience with the locals um, in quite a few of the countries as well. I kept, When we came into America, I'm not sure if it was in my head, but I noticed a difference in how people were viewing me when I was breastfeeding. Obviously, my baby had become bigger by then. And maybe it was in my head, but I just, I didn't see as many women breastfeeding in public. So I felt slightly more self-conscious about it. I tried to just let those thoughts go away and I breastfed anyway. But it was definitely a bit of a transition. And then even co coming back to London, I felt the same as America. Um, and I... I, I just felt more self-conscious. Um, in London, I got on a like a really busy tube and it was like packed with people and I felt self-conscious breastfeeding. Whereas in South America, mm. you just, I wouldn't have thought about it. <laughs> like everyone was breastfeeding. Yeah. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And I don't think it was in your head. I'm sure it was in my head. And <laughs> I, I, yeah. I mean, part of it is like that there's, there's so many children everywhere and babies in South America and, you know, family is such an important aspect of a lot of the lives, you know, the countries I went to. Um, and I guess in America, women have shorter maternity leaves, so there aren't as many women out with their babies. Um, but but still, yeah, it didn't feel as, definitely didn't feel as normalized, um, the culture of breastfeeding in, in the USA. 
Yeah, I've spent um, ex um, a pretty good amount of time in Central America. Yeah. And um, uh, uh, I speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. I, I was a bilingual educator. And um, a lot of my lactation practice over the years has been with Spanish speaking clients as yeah. well. And um, I, you know, there, there is something to be said for cultures where breastfeeding is everywhere. There's this big movement in the U.S., to normalize breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, you know, I think that probably exists in the UK as well. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we think, oh, it's normalized. It gets pushed at the hospital. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, your pediatrician pushes you to breastfeed, but that's different than being able to go out into the world and see it anywhere and everywhere. And also to be able to see children of all sizes. I think, yeah, breastfeeding. That's a massive thing. I think in, in London, like you would see, I guess, like women breastfeeding tiny babies, and that probably would be normalized. But w when they're coming, you know, toddlers and one year olds or beyond, you would feel very self, I, I would feel self conscious breastfeeding in London with an older baby. And that's such a shame mm -hmm. because, like, yeah, in Central mm -hmm. and South America, they just, it wouldn't even be a thing. You just do what you need to do for your child, and it's a natural process. So, right. You know, and when you see everyone else doing it, you feel really comfortable doing it. You don't feel like you're exposing yourself or you're doing something strange. You just, you know, parent your child how you would like to and how you should do. So, yeah, definitely. <laughs> there needs to be a normalised of breastfeeding in public um, in the UK and the USA. It's yeah, just yeah. as well. And it makes an impact. Makes yeah, if people are worried about, oh, can I go to this function? What if my toddler gets hungry? What if my baby gets hungry? Where the, will there be a space for me to breastfeed? Is somebody going to say something to me? That does impact not only milk supply because you have stress hormones flowing, but also your mental it health. It really does. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I, and this, when I was on the London, the London tube and a London bus, like when my baby was going towards one, um, this was a few weeks ago, it really, really, I, annoyed me that I was self-conscious and that it would even be a thing that you know I couldn't just breastfeed on public transport and that people might find it you know might be looking at me is you know everyone yeah. should be doing it without even yeah being self-conscious it's crazy yeah 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 I breastfed my oldest until he was a little over three and then my youngest until she was four and Amazing. a half yeah and even as a lactation advocate um, you know, the older they got, the more I would limit the public breastfeeding. And some of that was just like, no, go play. I don't feel like breastfeeding right now. And some of that was, I don't feel like having to say anything to anybody because I'm breastfeeding somebody who's walking up to me and saying they want to breastfeed. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and nobody ever did say anything to me, but you just reach this point where you don't want to have to have a confrontation if you oh, don't. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, you know, yeah, I felt a lot more when your baby's a newborn, I guess it's you feel a lot more comfortable with breastfeeding public, but why should it be any different when your child's two or three is mm -hmm. such a shame that you should even have to face that when you're parents. Yeah. And that yeah, I mean, if half the world don't find it strange and that they're so comfortable with it, why are the Western countries putting up this barrier, not allowing parents to mm. breastfeed freely with the tiny children? Yeah, I know. It's 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 hard. And it's it's great that you were able to experience places where um yes. That's it, more. you felt fully comfortable yeah yeah no completely one of those things just the more you're exposed to it you just you don't even see it anymore and I it would be the same in the western countries if everyone was just like breastfeeding their little kids you wouldn't be like looking oh my god there's a breast or, like let's have a look it just becomes something that you know I don't know that parent is feeding their child a bottle like why would I stare at that it becomes just like part of your culture this is a critical barrier to breastfeeding. Think about the last time you saw someone you didn't know openly breastfeeding. Why have the mammary glands of humans become so taboo? Why is it that the average age of human weaning across 
history and cultures is between ages two and seven, yet we barely ever see humans ingesting their first food. Why must we be closeted, covered, and isolated to feed our babies? I hope the next time you see someone feeding their baby from their own body that you give them a knowing nod and a smile and that our kids find feeding babies from mammary glands as normal as feeding babies from bottles. So it's definitely something that needs to be normalized in the UK. Yeah. Yeah. And the only way we normalize it is just to continue doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So were you ever, as you were traveling, were you ever, um, did you ever encounter anything like thrush or plugged ducks or mastitis? And were you, how did you get care if you did experience anything? So I did, I got really bad mastitis actually. Um, So when my baby was about seven months um, and we were obviously starting to introduce solids, she was eating more. And we were, I think we had just got off a flight from Peru it was a really bad timing we had a long flight to Ecuador and she'd been drinking all these like fruit smoothies so she drank less breast milk that day and I hadn't really thought about (laughs) mastitis and then on the plane I had the whole like oh no what is this it was like really one of my breasts was like agony and really red and then I came down with a really bad fever when I um, arrived in Ecuador Um, so that wasn't very fun but I I visited his medical center and they gave me some antibiotics and I was really trying to get my baby to feed from that side and express. And I did have like a hot bath at the Airbnb we were staying at. So that was great. So I was able to try and use a flannel to get rid of the excess milk and it did go away, but it was really painful and horrible. I didn't actually realize how bad it was. Um, (laughs) When you experience these things Mm. yourself, you realize how torturous some of these yeah breastfeeding conditions can be given how stressful getting good sleep can be when you have a baby I wanted to know what sleep was like for Millie while traveling with a baby for me I co-sleep with her so when she cries at night I get it bothers me because I wake up a lot but because we're sleeping together and I breastfeed she goes back to sleep pretty quickly so it didn't really doesn't really mm-hmm. disturb anyone else actually um being in a house yeah. with her but yeah, she she would make friends everywhere we went. We're actually friend. We're still sort of chatting with a couple of our Airbnb hosts. I think they were so they just loved staying in a house with Poppy so much. And they're like, "How how old is she now? How is she? We need to see photos." So they were, they were really excited about her. Yeah, and I guess when you're breastfeeding, you there are certain advantages to that. You've mentioned not having to clean bottles, but also I had asked about finding fresh water, and yeah. you do still need to find it for yourself, yeah. but yeah. not for the baby. Yeah, so that was definitely another really reassuring thing about breastfeeding, um, particularly in the early months, that obviously I, I was drinking bottled water, but I could always be reassured that my baby was drinking breast milk she wasn't going to be exposed to any level of risk with food or water um so you know if we couldn't find if we were in the early months when we were eating street food or food that might be less hygienic I would just be giving my baby breast milk and breastfeeding so I would know that she wouldn't be getting sick from anything um so it just made traveling so much more reassuring in terms of what we would be eating and drinking and does she have any toys or anything that you carry with you or you found she doesn't really need them because there's so much? <laughs> so we did bring a couple of toys with us. Well, I don't know about other babies, but she just seems to be like fascinated by them for about 10 minutes and then she never wants to look at them again. Mm-hmm. So I found lugging around these right. few toys completely pointless because she just did not care. Um, and I wasn't going to buy like a new toy every few days. So we sort of had a routine where we get into a new Airbnb and I get out all the like Tupperwares and wooden spoons and it was like the best soft play for her she was so intrigued and like yeah it was a great distraction for a couple a couple of hours possibly and is that shaping how you think you will um approach um what home will look like when you are back in a more permanent place yeah I guess I mean we have a like we have quite a a one bed small flat so we don't have space for loads of things 
Um, but it's less of an issue, you know, when you're not carrying them around all day and traveling. It's, it's nice to have toys in her house. I think she'll be bored of her wooden spoons after a few weeks. So who cares? <laughs> yeah. in the house. And it's just fun, isn't it? I guess when you're at home and it's, it's fun to buy your baby things, but they definitely don't need loads of toys and different gadgets because I don't know my baby just doesn't care she doesn't really want them she just wants to hang out with us and like discover new shells on the beach like that's a lot more exciting yeah yeah and so then as you um she was traveling as you transitioned to um uh foods yeah. table foods so what did that look like on the on the road so it was like something I was really nervous about before we traveled actually um, I was like really passionate about baby led weaning and making sure that my baby was exposed to lots of foods and she wouldn't be fussy when she was older and I could see it maybe being a problem that we were yeah weaning on the road um but I'd, I'd looked into it quite a lot I'd um I follow solid starts that give lots of information about exotic foods and babies um, and we started weaning her in Rio in Brazil. And for the like the very beginning, I would just go and buy her these like local mangoes and big local avocados. So she she was weaned on all this tropical fruit and she mm. she did really well. I, it, I think in the early days it was I was a lot more nervous about what I would feed her. Um, so it would mainly just be like the local market fruits. But as we went, she it it became really fun experimenting with all different meals and often we were able to and um, we had kitchens so we'd cook up all the local produce for her and it became like a really fun part of traveling actually because food for me and my partner is one of the best things about traveling anyway but sharing it with our baby was so fun and sort of watch her develop with food and be excited by everything um it's so fun sharing food with her whether yeah whether it was like star fruits and yeah. poo or um, durian or all sorts of weird things she's tried now. So hopefully she won't just want beans and toast. But she's going to be bored at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it's, a, it's interesting how we can really stress over the anticipation of something and then when it's happening. It's always fine, realize- absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it was something I was really nervous about. I was like, will I just have to give her purees from the shops? Because how will I do baby led weaning? But it just, it's, I mean, I guess all over the world, they, you know, their babies are weaned on food and that's, it's a natural process. So why would it be any different when you're across the world doing it? So it felt, it felt like a really, it felt natural and easy, but also again, we're in a better mental sort of space and we had time we weren't stressed so it was like a really fun aspect of um, our travels I think the only thing that I did really struggle with was not having a high chair it didn't bother me at the beginning but it's Mm. I got really sick of having like food all over my lap and just constantly having to change my own clothes it's so messy Mm. having a high chair Um, and sort of half eating my own meal and not being able to finish it because my baby's like (laughs) throwing things on me um so that yeah it's been nice being at home having a high chair that is definitely the one thing I missed (laughs) yeah that's interesting (laughs) one one essential item I think you do need in your flat at home but it wasn't essential when we were traveling we got through (laughs) yeah yeah wow that's interesting well as we wrap up are there any um moments any breastfeeding moments in particular that you hope as you're old and reminiscing (laughs) about your baby's early weeks and months or maybe out traveling that you hope stick in your brain as clear as they are now I do remember a really lovely um I think it was in Semic Champagne in Guatemala actually um like I said just everyone would breastfeed everywhere with like every age child and no one bat an eyelid and I was breastfeeding my baby and this woman was just like at a market store she was chatting to me and she had her three-year-old maybe that she was breastfeeding and her like little baby and she was sort of cooing over Poppy and saying how sweet she was and I just loved that kind of bond that we were breastfeeding and it was so natural and it was such a liberating experience um it just felt such like such a lovely way to bond with the locals but this is such a universal thing that we can all do around the world 
So I'm sure that moment will stay with me. That's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. I first came in contact with Millie initially on Instagram, where she shared the most amazing images of traveling with her baby. If you want to be inspired by breastfeeding photos and travel photos, you should check them out at Wild Travel Child on Instagram. I wanted to know what other resources Millie is sharing with the world to empower more families to travel with their babies. I just thought, wow, I, this is such a great experience for me, traveling with my baby. I wish other parents were conf- felt confident to do the same thing during maternity leave. So I started a travel blog on Instagram. Um, you can have a look, it's Wild Travel Child. And I've gone on to make a website um, with travel tips and inspiration and I'm going to, I'm not sure where it's going to go, but I just really want to build confidence and inspire other parents to do the same thing because it's such an amazing thing to be able to do with your baby. Um, If only, you know, to live out your own dreams um, when you're mum, to carry on doing the the things that you love uh, also with your baby. I think it's such a lovely part of motherhood to be able to do that. Yeah, it really, really is. And are you hoping that, Um, It will be useful for people who are thinking about both short term trips and long term trips. No, I think what we did was like what we did was pretty adventurous. I I, I don't think Uh I think, this, you know, even going away for a weekend camping or like anything is amazing to be able to do with a baby. So, yeah, the um, our website and our um, blog is just focused around any type of travel with your baby, um, however small and big. Um, all those tips, you know, like flying with the baby, um, solid food with the baby. So, and it's not just focused around breastfeeding. I want women to know that they can bottle feed, they can do whatever. and They should have confidence to travel with their baby and their kids. And it's a lot more overwhelming to try and, you know, plan and think about than it is when you're there. So you'll you'll have a great time once you're actually That's on the road. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I see, I'm in a lot of the breastfeeding um, support groups online, and there are a lot of people asking questions. Oh, I have to travel next Mm -hmm. week, or in three weeks I'm traveling, and I'm really nervous about X, Y, or Z. Does anybody have any tips? I think it's the most liberating thing to be able to do the things you love, but also be a mum and do it with your kids. And why why shouldn't you be doing that? Why would any child not want to go camping in the wilderness or adventuring? I mean, that's the dream as a child. So it's very yeah. empowering that you, you know, you, sh- you can just carry on doing all those things. Um, right. And you might have to make adjustments, you know, there might, you might do it a little differently than how you did it before, but um, you can still yeah. do it. I mean, every child's advent- so adventurous at heart and every child loves nature. So it's just bringing that out of them and really, um, but yeah, no. Yeah. yeah, it's pretty amazing. So I thank you so much for bringing this perspective to the Milk Making Minutes and to talking about what breastfeeding was like for you as you've traveled. And Absolutely. that's so great. As this episode releases, I have embarked on a nearly three week cross country road trip with my own family to the Grand Canyon from Massachusetts. It was such a pleasure to talk to Millie about how traveling helped her to bond with her baby during the postpartum period and to hear her passion for encouraging others to travel with their families. This is a way we can reclaim that piece of us that sometimes lies dormant during new parenthood. And I encourage you to consider how you can add some adventures into your life with your family. Those of the weekend camping trip sort or those of the sell everything and travel in an RV sort. Both create those core memories with our families that matter so much for our own healing and help us remember why we became parents in the first place. If you know a parent who could be inspired to take adventures with their baby during their parental leave, please share this episode with them. Do it right now. And then, of course, share all the resources that Millie has to offer as well. Thanks.